shit. This is the hard knock life, but not the chicken kind. More like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different life. Welcome back to another episode of Hard Knock Life. From the Nerds of Color, I am once again your host, Keith Chow. Uh, we're doing this a little bit differently this week. Uh, this is going to be a two-part crossover podcast with another podcast that I that I host that's not part of the Nerds of Color, but uh, is a really fun show. It's part of the DC TV Podcast Network. It's called DC TV Classics. I host that show along with Desiree Rodriguez and Brittany Monet, who are also coincidentally Nerds of Color contributors. Uh, the three of us usually get together and talk about the history of DC Comics on television. Uh, we've had really cool guests in the past, such as Susan Eisenberg, who played Wonder Woman on uh, the Justice League animated series. We've had the entire Star Kid Productions team uh, to talk about their holy musical Batman, um, stuff like that. So we, we, it's a pretty cool show. If you haven't had a chance, please subscribe to DC TV Classics on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Um, the reason we're doing a two-part crossover podcast this week is because uh, this week's guest on Hard Knock Life and DC TV Classics is a really cool person. Uh, he's Alfred Goff, who is one half of Goff Miller Productions, best known for creating Smallville on the WB and CW, and currently producing the Shannara Chronicles on MTV, as well as Into the Badlands on AMC. Al was kind enough to take some time to talk with me. So we spent a lot of time talking about Smallville, and we also spent a lot of time talking about Into the Badlands and just the idea of diversity and inclusion on television. So how it's going to work is today on Hard Knock Life, you're going to listen to the first part of my conversation with Al, in which we touch on subjects including Asian American representation, uh, their history working with a lot of Hong Kong movie stars, um, including and breaking roles for Asian American actors. Uh, and then in the second part, you tune into DC TV Classics on Sunday. You know, you'll listen. You'll be able to catch the second half of my conversation, in which Al and I talk about the history of Smallville, and, and just uh, I basically nerd out because, as you all know, my favorite show of all time is Smallville. So uh, sit back, relax, check out this first part uh, of my conversation with Al Goff, uh, where we touch on things from Into the Badlands to Jackie Chan, Jet Li. Um, and just, just Asian representation in general, being one of the few uh, Hollywood screenwriter producers who, uh, you know, has, has been good looking out for the Asian American community and people of color in general. So uh, check it out and uh, I'll see you on the other side. Uh, I'm here with Al Goff, the co-executive producer of Smallville Into the Badlands, Shannara Chronicles. Welcome to uh, the podcast, Al. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I, I just, I want to put up front, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I've been, I was, oh. I was down with Smallville from 2001. I was actually a big fan of martial <laughs> law back in the day. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Wow. So That's yeah, cool. I, I go That's back cool. a long way. Yeah. I mean, I want to, I want to start off by just kind of talking a little bit about just how you got your start. Like what brought, what attracted you to, to writing for television and, and film? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've always probably from the age of 15, you know, I was, you know, like most uh, people my age, I was a child of the sort of Spielberg Lucas uh, generation. So I grew mm -hmm. up on, you know, Jaws and Close Encounters and Raiders and and E.T. Um, and I think in Star Wars, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I think I was about 15 and it was after I'd seen E.T. that I really sort of looked into what a filmmaker does, you know what I mean? And I sort of became, and this of course is, you know, pre-internet. So, right. and I grew up in a small town in Maryland. So it's not like there's a ton of information about how films are made. So I, I, you know, became sort of obsessed with being a filmmaker and, you know, would make super eight movies mm. when I was younger. And then, you know, I was like the audiovisual dude in my high school. So I had the first VHS camera cause I'm that old. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I would I would record all like the school like basketball games and things like that. But then they would basically let me do whatever I wanted with the camera. So I started making you know films with that, and then was very involved in you know high school and then college theater. But and then I worked in in PR for a while in New York after college. But I you know I was like if I don't uh, if I don't try to chase this dream now I'm never going to do it. So I applied right. to the Peter Stark uh, producers program in the uh, at USC and the it's now called the School of Cinematic Arts then it was just the USC Film School of Film and Television 
and I got in, and so I moved out here. I literally packed my car. Whatever I could fit my car went. I knew nobody in L.A. I had one <laughs> friend who I stayed with for a couple of days before the, you know, I moved into the graduate housing. And, you know, my first week of film school, I met Miles Miller, my, uh, my writing and producing partner. And within a year, you know, we realized very quickly in the producer's program that the, the, the fastest way to get anything done is to write. So we wrote a script in film school and sold it before we graduated. And the film never got made, but it became our tuition to learn how to write. Mm -hmm. And probably two years later, we were approached by a, by a BBC, by a British company called Carnival Films, which are the, which is actually the company that produces Downton Abbey now, but back oh, in the, yeah, back in the mid nineties, they had a, had a series called Bugs, B-U-G-S, which was a, like a Mission Impossible spy show. And they were looking for writers because they couldn't find British writers who could do action adventure. <laughs> and, um, and so we, Miles and I ended up writing two episodes of that show, which was kind of our entree into television. And then, you know, we got a television agent, you know, at our agency after that. And, you know, we started to look into it. And then we, you know, we were on, we decided to staff on a few, you know, we staffed on, there was a show way back that lasted about eight episodes called Time Cop, which was a television series based on the film. And then we staffed on Martial Law, which was a kung fu show on CBS that starred Sammo Hung, who was a, you know, a very big, and it still is, a big sort of movie star in China and also a quite, uh, a quite renowned fight director. Mm. Um, and, and that was sort of, was interesting, it, it, you know, and at the time we were, um, that we were doing martial law, we had written Lethal Weapon 4, which starred With Jet, Jet Li. Lee. Yeah. Yeah. And then that led, interestingly, it was Lethal Weapon 4, the producers of Rush Hour at the time, you know, called us up and said, we're doing this movie with Jackie Chan. It's called Rush Hour. You know, if the movie makes, you know, 40, 50 million dollars, we want to make another movie with Jackie. And he has an idea. And we're like, great, what's the idea? And he goes, he wants to do a Western. We're like, great, what's the idea? They go, that's the idea. He wants to do a Western. <laughs> so we so we basically came up, you know, with the pitch for, you know, Shang, what became Shanghai Noon and um, went in and pitched it to Jackie. And he loved it. And then, you know, Rush Hour came out like a couple months later and was obviously a massive hit, much bigger than anybody thought it would be. And, you know, within you know, six or seven months after rush hour, they were in production on Shanghai News. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our, you know, so we've always had this sort of dual sort of television feature right. um, existence because, you know, when, and, and one always seemed to kind of fuel the other, you know, Lethal Weapon 4 also, um, you know, gave us a relationship with Joel Silver and we ended up doing a television series called The Strip which ran on mm. UPN, which is a network that doesn't exist anymore, um, <laughs> back in the late '90s, and that led to um, led to a to a relationship with Warner Brothers Television, and that led to Smallville. And then right. once we once we did Smallville, we went from being the you know buddy comedy guys, you know, from Lethal Weapon and Shanghai Noon to the superhero guys, and that led to you know, Spider-Man 2 and, and very, you know, in early drafts of Iron Man when it was still at New Line Cinema. That's so, right. That's right. I yeah. forgot that was part of your of yeah. your resume. So it, it's interesting that, like, people who only know Golf Millar from Smallville were probably surprised by you guys creating Into the Badlands. But if you really track right. the career, right, you worked with Sam O'Hung, Jet Li, Jackie Chan. It only makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we worked with uh, – no, it's, you know, it's very interesting because, you know, we work with Jet twice. Twice. You know, we did Lethal Weapon 4 with Jet, and then we did Mummy and the, 3. And the Mummy, that's right. Yeah, yeah with, with Jet and Michelle Yeoh. So we've actually worked with, yeah, with Jackie, Jet, you know, um, Michelle Yeoh, Donnie Yen, who was the villain in Shanghai Nights, uh, Sam Hung. So we've, we've actually worked with, we've worked with all the big ones. And, you know, Daniel Wu and, and Stephen Fung, you know, who right. are our partners on Into the Badlands. You know, Daniel Stars and Stephen's are our, our Fight director, but Fight this, director. this season is also is also directing directed two episodes of the show. They oh, were really? managed by yeah yeah he directs uh, episodes 
uh, seven and eight this year. Steven cool. Does. So, um, which was great, and he did a terrific job. But they were managed by Jackie Chan. So we all have like one degree of Jackie Chan. And what's and also what's interesting is Master Didi, who was our fight choreographer, mm-hmm. was Jet Li's stunt double, and did did additional choreography because he he started working under Wu Ping. So he you know so he worked not only on Lethal Weapon four, but he also choreographed the Michelle Yeoh Jet Li fights for Mummy. And then he also worked on, you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and The Matrix, and Kill Bill, and all sorts of, you know, so he's he's quite, um, you know, so, but we we all have kind of, you know, it's like one degree of separation between, you know, who who we who we know in in Hong Kong cinema, <laughs> right? Well, you know, I, I we should just go ahead and follow this thread though, since since you know I, I did want to touch on Into the Badlands and. And everything sure, around that, so we can always get we can we can always circle back to Smallville. But just taking this thread yeah. further, you know, one of the things at the Nerds of Color that we talk about a lot, and I talk about in particular, is just Asian and Asian American representation in media. And and you know, if you again look at your CV, it's kind of like <laughs> you're one of the few Hollywood producers that that have made a concerted effort to to not only you know highlight you know, Kung Fu uh, and martial arts stars, but just, you know, Asians and Asian Americans in general, because if you think, you know, you have other movies on your resume, such as uh, Bullet in the Head, which, which starred Sun Kang and you worked with Lucy Liu, like, you know, so you have, you know, was, was it always kind of part of your, uh, like, was it always intentional to try to spotlight more Asian and Asian American stars? Well, you know, what's interesting is, is, you know, I'd love to sit here and say yes, and it was always our, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, the, but no, but I mean, the, the truth is, you know, we loved obviously doing, you know, we were huge fans of Jackie and jumped mm-hmm. at the chance to, to write a Jackie Chan movie. Jet, frankly, we didn't really know and sort of discovered through Lethal Weapon 4 that, I don't mean we discovered, I'm saying we right, right. sort of realized who he was and, and his, and what he did in, in, Asian cinema and, and was just impressed because it was a totally different style than Jackie's. It was, you know, um, it was amazing. He was, and he, he was still is, but he was so fast. I mean, watching yeah. that was just it was <laughs> unbelievable to watch. It was crazy. But, um, and I think for us, it was, you know, and it's interesting because in Shanghai noon, we were actually given award by, um, given an award by MANA, mm-hmm. um, which is a, uh, and, I, and now I'm going to blank on on what the actual acronym yeah, is. Yeah, it's like the Media Asian American National ac- ac- National Net- Network or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, and and they and they gave it to us for the positive portrayal of of Asians in mm-hmm. film, and specifically in Shanghai Noon, because and I, you know this was interesting and not something I realized. They said because Jackie ended up with the girl, the the, <laughs> the white guy didn't get the girl, and that was, right, right. And, that, and I said, and I you know being naive and you know. I was like, I was like, oh, really? That doesn't, and they're like, no. And then I guess when I thought about it, you know, it's true. Like, it's not something, it's not something that, certainly when I thought about it and looked back over cinema, I'm like, oh, you're right. I, this doesn't really happen that much. It's not yeah. something that's, that's certainly highlighted. And I think, you know, for us, you know, it's just something, you know, we, and obviously our entree into, this is, we've always obviously done some version of a martial arts film, but you know, I think for us, and certainly on Into the Badlands, we wrote the character as Asian. Like, we mm-hmm. set it in the pitch, mm-hmm. we set it up front, we go, Sonny's Asian, um, and we said, we know that's going to be super hard to find, but we have a secret weapon, because our executive producer, who is not yet starring in the show, is <laughs> a big Chinese movie star who was born in San Francisco, moved mm-hmm. to Hong Kong, <laughs> is, 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 a, is, a, is a really good actor, and a really good martial artist. So, I mean, right. I think I, my joke with Daniel is the last person who thought he was going to star in Into the Badlands was Daniel. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so, but he, you know, so I think it's something, you know, and we wanted him, and the Vale relationship was very important. You know what I mean? Like, that was an important relationship, you know, and obviously the baby, and obviously it's the thing that's driving, you know, certainly right. season one, and now obviously in season two, he wants to get back to his family. And then when we saw Madeline, you know, we very much wanted to cast her. And, you know, it's interesting, again, something I wasn't really aware of, but Daniel told me, he said, you know, the last time there was an, an Asian 
man and an African American woman on screen. It was in in the Jet Li Aaliyah movie. <laughs> Romeo and Must Die. I was yeah. Romeo Must Die, and he said, you know, there was a big thing about the kiss, and then they end, and I and I actually remembered it because it's a movie Jet made after Lethal Four, and I so right. then I kind of re- kind of remembered. And I said, well, you know, it's been 20 years or something. Like it's this is it's a different time. And Daniel's like, well, we'll see. And the fact that <laughs> people really, well, I think he was just kind of like, okay, here we go. And you know, always always very positive. But I think there, and I hadn't, I didn't really know that story. Neither Miles nor I did. But and then you know to see it actually celebrated. I mean, again, and, and again, I don't mean to sound Pollyanna or to sound naive. I'm like, I guess. That's a big deal in 2017. It doesn't. It's not something for us. You know, we always try to be sort of colorblind in our casting. Like we wrote, you know, we wrote Sonny as Asian, but everybody else could be anything. Obviously, right. once we cast Quinn, you know, and this is the thing. You know, once you cast Quinn, and we got Marton, and then we've got Orla, mm-hmm. we're like, okay, well, the kid needs to be white. So there's certainly right, right. there's certainly white people in the show, but we also didn't want to give the impression that all the Barons were white. So, you know, getting Eddie in season one for us was a big deal, too, because we wanted Jacoby to be African-American. Mm-hmm. I said, we want to have, you know, African-American. I wanted the River King to be African-American. Like, right. there's, it, some of it is, like, what I found we've had to do, and it's interesting, and certainly even when the show moved to Ireland, is you have to say very explicitly up front when you're casting extras, when you're casting um, guest stars, when you're casting day players, you have to specifically say we want people of color and we want them featured in the shots. It's one of those things sometimes I'm I'm a little like I don't know why people won't just do this. And by the <laughs> way, I'm not I'm not casting I'm not casting aspersions on anyone, but I just think it's something you have to tell people this is how like we this show is set hundreds of years in the future. It is right. not a white world. We want we want people of color all through the show in all different, you know, social strata, you know what I mean, whether it's from clippers and barons and dolls right. and cogs and, you know, nomads and that that we are very vigilant about, you know, and, and it's something that that I think, you know, and even on this year on on our other series, the Shinar Chronicles, you know, one of the knocks on that show in season one. Right, right. And I get it. And I by the way, I get it, and I will say it wasn't for lack of trying. We didn't we you know, the only sort of minority or person of color on that show is Manu Bennett who is you know who was Maori, Maori who was, a, who was yeah. basically native, native New Zealander, and this year, you know we we had four new roles, three are African American, one is Asian, so we we actually made a very concerted effort to do that, and also you know with the extras. Now again, there's not a lot of people of color in New Zealand. It's something you really have to focus on. You know what I mean? Like you certainly have, but you have a fair amount of. Um, an influx from Asia and and you know South Asia, mm-hmm. but it's still something that you have to to do. And that you know they don't frankly have a lot of. In, in that case, they wouldn't be African American. They just don't have a lot of black people. In New Zealand. Right, right. So, so well, it's think, so it's something that you know you have to you you. I, but I think as a as a producer, like you have to be very aware of that. Right. And you and you have to and you have to make sure that people are you know. What I call the drift, like we we started, I think Miles was watching dailies for Shannara, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, and and he sent out an email to the extra saying, guys, we said this before, I just want to say it again, this is a, and that obviously is also a post-apocalyptic world in the future. He goes, we need people of color in the shots, we we have to be conscious of this, please, you know what I mean? It's it's always one of those things where you're you're sending out. I would say sometimes gentle reminders, sometimes not so gentle reminders that, that this is something that certainly for, you know, for our shows, which are set in the future, where frankly, we don't want color or sexuality. Like it shouldn't even be, it's part of our, our conversation obviously as, as, but I'm saying in the conversation of the show, the show isn't about, neither show is about, racial prejudice the prejudice is all is you know into the badlands is really social you know it's your mm-hmm. it's what cast you're in you know whether you're a baron or a cog or a you know doll or a nomad or something you know you want the world to be colorblind and you don't want them to have even views about sexuality we just wanted to be whether you're homosexual heterosexual gender fluid whatever you are it's not part of the conversation that world because it's, people are so far past that 
That it's right. not what the world, you know, the world of the Badlands is about power. It's about can you fight or can you not fight. If you're powerful and you can fight no matter your color or your gender, you're, you're going to get on top. And if you're not, you're going to be in the underclass. Like that's kind of the thing. But we as television producers in, in 2017 still have to just be very cognizant that, that, that people of color, that the world of the show also represents our world. And I just think right. that's something that, that we've always, I just think that's important to do. I just think that's what, and that's what television does really well when you do it. Like, you know, I believe that one of the reasons Barack Obama was elected president is because in 2001, 24 had a black president. You know what I mean? Right. And I think, right, right. I, I think the reason, you know, that, you know, homosexuality isn't this sort of, you know, taboo subject that it was 20 years ago is because you had Ellen, you had shows like Will right. and Grace. Like you just, like if you can't, this is, I mean, I think this is what, you know, entertainment can do, which is it can actually, and not to sound preachy and whatnot, but you can <laughs> influence how people think and how they see the world. And, in a, in a, and I don't think it's in city. I think just to say you live where you live, but this is, this is how the world is now, and here's an introduction to it. And that's what you, you know, when you, you think about the shows you watched that you were a kid that, would, that suddenly made you not look at the world the same way your parents did. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that I wanted that I want to touch on that you were just speaking of, and, and one in particular is like what you said about awareness and vigilance, and you know, unfortunately, you, you know, credit to you and Miles that, that that you do put that effort into you know populating the worlds of your shows with with you know what the world looks like currently, but it's something that seems to you know so many so many creators in Hollywood don't understand that right, like this whole push towards more inclusion and more diversity falls on a lot of deaf ears. Um, you know, people are surprised that, you know, women and people of color don't have the same opportunities as white men. And and no, the I fact thought, that I thought that was I thought that was fact I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like this is a thing that, that people in you know that's that write about it, that talk about pop culture, you know, this is the the message we're trying to, to like permeate is that it's all about opportunity. And if and if you are, you know, willfully oblivious about the lack of opportunity for people of color, that's it's this vicious circle that happens, right? That you know, yeah. if you don't put Asian people in, in your shows to gain the kind of you know popularity that would rec that would allow them to be leads of shows, they'll never be able to do that, right? Like, but it's just weird kind of you know onus on people of color to like you have to be able to be a box office star or a you know top liner well, that, that can that can guarantee ratings, know, but no one no one else right. needs to have that same pressure right no and it's you know and i remember growing up you know it's interesting and you're and you're right and i you know i remember you know you had eddie murphy and you had mm. bill cosby and then obviously will smith and i think at a certain point and even you know frankly you know there's a great line in the people versus oj simpson where he goes i'm not black i'm oj <laughs> and i think there were certain there were certain in certainly african-american stars who after a while transcended race where people didn't think about them as as black you know what i mean it's mm -hmm. just like you you would go see an eddie murphy you go see an eddie murphy movie you you like we watched the cosby show you go see a will smith movie it's just it's just an interesting thing but your point and you know this is always in, in what i love about chris rock was like you had to so far over deliver that that it, that it wasn't even a a question of of your race but it's Right, and that's used, that's used that used to be how it was, and you know people, you know, I think most of Hollywood goes, you know, you're like, well, you're, you know, you're not inclusive. And they're like, but look, we have Eddie Murphy. We right. Have, well, you know, what I mean? or, you know, you know not, again, not to, ca Smith. not to cast aspersions yeah. on on other people in the industry, that, and I don't want to put you in that position, but there was a there was a yeah. news recently of of a show that was written for people of color that they've cast white people because they couldn't find the right people of color to play the roles, and it's like. You know, but how hard, like, did you just give it to Will Smith? He said no. So, okay, I guess I got to cast a white guy. Like, what is the what is the line of demarcation between whether or not enough people of color are the right fit? Because like you said with Into the Badlands, you know, right? you were like, no, this, this has to be an Asian, I mean, an Asian American lead, too. Because that's, that's another yeah. thing that often gets conflated. Like, the thing about Daniel is that people think, okay, he was a star in Hong Kong, but he's actually, like, he's an American guy, right? He he no, did the Bruce Lee, Daniel, he did the Bruce Lee thing yeah. where he had to like 
because he didn't have yeah. opportunities here. He had to go to Hong Kong to to become a, a star, you know. I mean, what's interesting about Daniel is he went. He didn't go to Hong Kong to become a star. He went to Hong Kong to witness. He was filming like the handover, you know, in in '98, and then got, literally got discovered at a party. Right. I mean, <laughs> Daniel has the most amazing. I would call it's the most amazing Hollywood story. It just happened in Hong Kong, right. and then he became a star there. But he will tell you he's kind of. He, in some ways, he's not Asian enough for the for for yeah. for China, and he's and he's not American enough for America. I would think Daniel right. lives in this. You know, he's a stranger in a strange land, which is, by the way, is very Bruce Lee. That is very much well, it, Bruce that's, Lee. Th- that's the Asian American experience. Like the Asian American yes. experience is being the ultimate outsider in Asia and America. Yes. And we won't name yeah. another martial arts show that didn't understand that. So we won't go there. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Because, again, I right. don't want to put you on the spot, but, you know, you did happen to right. premiere Into the Badlands the same weekend. But I think what it did do, which and this is what I am happy about, is it put the focus on how hard it is to do good martial art, uh, great martial arts on television. And, like, you you can see, like, when you, when you, you know, do it with a Hong Kong team, which isn't easy, it's not mm-hmm. inexpensive, but it's <laughs> worth it. And I think right. that's... You know, so that to, so to me, if anything, you know, but I was just, it was just an interesting object lesson for for our show to to because I think it did highlight, especially to critics, how hard mm-hmm. it is to do a good martial arts show because I think a lot of times martial arts gets written off. Yeah, as a genre beyond just the fight choreography too. I think what what Into the Badlands, you know, whether it was intended to or not also got caught up at least from like my community and the the nerd of color community writ large you know into the badlands as you were saying earlier the fact that it that it features not one but two asian americans asian american leads you know an african-american love interest uh even though veil i guess uh, madeline is british but you know she's playing american she's british yeah she is um (laughs) she's actually mixed race yeah no her her dad's her dad's black and her mom's white yeah, she's, she's mixed race, and then but we have, and then we have Chippo, you know, the master, the, right? Exactly, who is she's actually black and Asian. She's Asian, yeah, she's Asian and and Nigerian. So it's just you know, but but you know, but the the, the thing about Into the Badlands, and I mean, the bar none, the, the martial arts choreography is fantastic, and and it's a it's a you know it's a master class every every week. But I think into where Into the Badlands really excels. Uh, especially in this current, you know, environment, is in representation that you have people of color everywhere. You have women who are who are not, you know, in stereotypical roles, who are not like shrinking violets. Everyone down the line, from the widow on down, are are these powerful women. Like even more than the martial arts is that show where it's probably one of the most representative shows on te- television right now. Oh well, thank you. I mean, I think the the the, the great thing about martial arts is it's actually the great equalizer. <laughs> because you don't have to be powerful, you don't have to be big. So so you can have women versus men and it feels like a fair fight. Right. In the case of the widows, hardly a fair fight, <laughs> but you understand. But but you know what I mean? And I think yeah. that's something and if you talk to Master Didi and you talk to Steven and then it's also there is because there is a beauty to martial arts choreography, I always describe them as dance numbers. You know, each each totally. martial arts fight has a concept. They have a story and we learn this from from you know from Jackie, you know what I mean? Like, like they are they are dance numbers which have to be both plot movers and showstoppers. And I think that's something. And you know, Master Didi, I think would much rather choreograph a fight for women than guys because he just thinks mm-hmm. they look, frankly, look more beautiful doing it. Like like it just mm-hmm. the moves look better. Like everything he does, it just it just, yeah. just he's just like it's just a better. They look amazing and they you know have the flexibility and stuff and. You know, but it's. I think that's it. So I think again, what's what the show does, and then of course you take that because you know it's it's the interesting thing of you're taking martial arts and you know it's like you want the Hong Kong style martial arts and an American drama, and you want them to feel like they coexist and are not two right. different shows. So I think right. so. In order to do that, you know, of course the women had to be strong because you're putting them in situations where they're then going to have to do do martial arts and also it's the future. And to us, it was just, how do we take all these paradigms and flip them on their, and, you know, flip them on their head, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's not, you know, it's, it's cause yeah. So it's just, you want it to feel different. You want it to feel, and then sadly that it, that's what it takes to feel different. 
you know, in 2017. But, right, um, right. you know, but it's but it is something that, you know, that we're very conscious of, you know, and, and we really want to do and always, you know, look, I have two daughters. Miles has two daughters. Stacy Cher, who's who's our fellow executive producer, has always been, you know, who makes these, you know, she's Quentin Tarantino's producer and did Aaron Brockovich and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. you know, we have Karen Richards, who's our co-EP in, in, in Ireland. He's in the show. Like the show's got a lot of strong women involved as well. Well, you know, <laughs> that reminds well. me too. And I, I want to, I, I do want to, I know I do want to get to Smallville, but I, I, I that also yeah. reminds me of like, you know, you had mentioned with Shannara, how responsive you guys were to, to the critique of not enough people of color. And, you know, I think if there was one critique of into the Badlands season one is that there were very few women of color, but this year you seem to have responded to that with Baron Chow, with the master, yeah. Uh, th- that yeah. you know, like on 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 blurred Twitter was everyone loved the uh, the butterfly with the afro, right? Like so, I like, feel like that way, you, you guys are very amazing. responsive. She, to yeah, I, she's got. I just I I love her. I love that look. Like again, it's like it goes to the aesthetic of the show. And when we when we saw her, we were like we we're like we have got to have her. Like she needs to be in the shots. She needs because it's just so it's just so great. And by the way, and like I, and I'm glad people brought it up because it's like you don't see that on TV, right? You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like it's just it's crazy. I mean, I, and this is I guess we'll, we'll we'll pin the we'll pin it on this about into the badlands. What what has you? And I know that you guys really took to the you know the hashtag color me badlands. You which black girl nerd started? You know you guys helped us uh, trend NOC badlands. When we were when we were binging the Netflix, uh, uh, right. when we were binging on Netflix last weekend. Like, how how do you? What's your reaction to just the the black nerd, the nerd of color community, kind of like coming out full force for the show? Look, I think it's amazing, but but this is something, and this is something that Miles and I knew, and I think was a surprise to to the network. We said you you have to understand because you know we we obviously are fans of martial arts films and also just around with like martial arts films have a huge African-American following. Like yes. they're huge in the African-American community. And I, we said to them, we said, you, we're going to, I said, I predict we will do very well if we do this properly with the African-American community, with other, with obviously with the Asian American community, mm-hmm. but, but it's something that I think, and that's why, you know, we very much wanted, you know, the community represented like they're, you know, that they're, there, there is a, you know, there, there's no, it's not a surprise that Bruce Lee had, who was it? Who was in? Um, who was in Enter the Dragon? He was, he was one of the three. There was like three, three guys on the island. It was him, uh, Jim yes. Kelly, and uh, uh, yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the, on the white guy. <laughs> yes. No, no. Yeah, so Jim I think Kelly. it's something that. Yeah. Yeah, that's who it is. But that's something you know. We we sort of knew. Like as a as a genre that this was that this was a genre that African Americans have always embraced. So mm-hmm. so I think I think we were that we knew, and I think that to the network's great surprise and delight that we we do so well, you know, with African American viewers. Again, I think what the show does do, since it's not set, since it is a you know fantasy world, you're set in the future, post apocalyptic, is you can you can just put you can have characters in the show. And, you know, we don't talk about their race in the show. They just are. You know what I right, mean? And I right. think that's the other thing, too. Like, you don't have to sit there and put a lot of import on it. You can actually just make your show populate the world, you know, so so that you see, you know, because I say the future isn't going to be white people. Like, it's just not. <laughs> like, you go look at any, like, you look at Time Magazine. Like, like frankly, they're going to, everybody's going to look like Aramis. You know, Aramis right. is the ultimate, you know, he's like Pakistani right. and South Asian. And German and st- you know what I mean, but he's just like he's everything. <laughs> but, I mean, I, yeah, I, I yeah. always call Aramis kind of you know boy of the future because that's really the world as we as it as we keep evolving. But that's so, the thing, right? Even if it because it, narratively it makes sense, but as you were saying earlier, like just the message that it sends in 2017 in into the world where people who like me who are starving for that kind of representation, it's. It's a godsend. So I, I really appreciate you and Miles for, you know, having having the balls really to just say we're going to put this kind of show on TV and you know we're we're gonna we're gonna yeah, fight well, hard because that's the thing, right? Because people there there needs to be more people like that that says we're gonna we're not gonna take the easy way and just say well we have you know we can't hire people of color just because and and really right. put it put an effort into it. Well, I think I you know and look we we're on you know AMC has been great and completely mm-hmm. supportive and never 
have always been very encouraging about that. We're totally cool. Like, never blinked once at having an Asian American lead. Like, it was never even a conversation. We said, this is what we're doing. They said, great. And then we, when we started to cast, because what they like to do as a network, which I think is great, is they're not actually interested in familiar faces. You know what I mean? Right. They want to find the new faces. They don't want, you know, a particular. And look, obviously, we've got, you know, Stephen Lang, who's amazing, Lance Henriksen, who's amazing. Like, we've had people you clearly recognize in the show. Right. But they would, but they would much rather have the interesting actor or the interesting face that you're not going to be like, oh, look, it's this person, and pulls you out of the experience of watching the show. I mean, look, <laughs> right. at, you know, look, look at Walking Dead; they do it brilliantly. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just like none of those, none of those people were stars. I mean, I remember Andrew Lincoln from like Love Actually, kind exactly. Of, but but <laughs> right. but you know, he was a you know he was a working British actor, and right. you know, but I think that's something that as a network they've always tried to do, you know, like they'd rather break new talent or find the, the interesting, you know, actor who hasn't really had a chance to shine. So I think it's, you know, I think that's something that, you know, we're very lucky. We're not on a broadcast network where you, where frankly, you, you do sometimes sit in those rooms and they're like, oh, okay, if we can't get one of these 10 people as a lead, we're going to roll this pilot or we're not going to do it or we need it to do, you know. So yeah. it, it's, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the difference, you know, a lot of times. I, yeah, I read something online, and I frankly didn't look at it. There were two was it two pilots recently but that were – they were written as, as – I don't know if it was as African-American or Asian-American. No, or that, that's actually – I think that's – right. That's, the, that's what I was referencing earlier. It was like this – oh. I think it was on CBS or NBC or something that they were – like the lead character is named Malik in the pilot, in the script at least. Right. And, and they ended up casting a white guy and a white woman for for roles. I think they're supposed to be African American and Latina. And I guess now they got right. to go back and rewrite it to fit the white people. But yeah, it's this it's this notion that you know how hard did, like I, I I know I don't know what the actual excuse is, but like how hard did you really try to you know to find? And that's that's right. the kind of like that's the that's the glass ceiling that I think people in Hollywood have a hard time understanding who, who think Hollywood right. is meritocracy a meritocracy when it when it clearly isn't because there are there's a lot of talent viola davis said it right like there's so much talent that all they need is the opportunity and if you're denying them the opportunity yeah. they'll never be able to succeed um no, no and it's you know and it, it is true and it's and it's interesting i think the older i get the more i realize that because i i'm sure i'm sure 20 years ago i thought the same thing you know what yeah. I mean? because you're like it's hollywood they're just interested like if you're good like and money you, you just always <laughs> they just want to I mean, make money part of the aaron you know there was part of that aaron sorkin line even though i thought it was very naive i I did sort of go like you know if you i i always believe like you write a great script no matter what color you are no matter what gender you are people will find it and you'll be great because you're always interested in talent and then you're like yeah no that's not entirely true (laughs) that's easy for me to say then you go like ah, that's easy for me to say guess what as a white dude so it's not it's not the case it's something you have to make a concerted effort about you're always looking for the for the best writers and look don't get me wrong we've got a lot of white people writing on our show but we definitely try to you know we try to we we really you, you want all the voices in the room that's the other thing too and i think this is something that you know as we've gotten you know i won't say older i'll say more seasoned <laughs> is that you want a room that has a lot of opinions and a lot of different points of view because yeah. that's the only way your show is going to grow and obviously, look, you need the people who can write the scripts well, who, who, have the, who have the experience, but you need, but you do need points of view that aren't your own or, you know what I mean, or, or from a different realm. And you, and you just have to, you know, a writer's room is something you have to cast in a way. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you have yeah, to go, yeah. I need this and I, you know, I need this or I don't have this or I wish we had more of X or Y or something. So that's something that you're always – that you're always looking to do, to do as well. But, you know, I just, I, I do find that it's something that as, as creators and as producers and as writers, it's like, you just got to be vigilant about all of this stuff in a, in a way that I was probably very naive about and didn't really think about in my younger days. And, you know, but I guess it's just, you know, I have kids now and I see the world they're growing up in and I see their friends and they're all sort of, it's all kind of colorblind, which is great. But even then you got, you can't just, you know, it's not something you can just take for granted, you know, right. and, and, you know, you have to, you have to, and by the way, I'm not saying we're the best at it. I think like we can always, you can always be better. There's mm-hmm. always spots where I'm like, oh, we should do that. Like on, like literally on Shinar, I'm like, 
when the criticism came out, I'm like, I was totally expecting it. Mm-hmm. I totally get it. Our, our our first thing we were trying to do is we wanted to cast Al-Anon as African-American or black. And mm-hmm. look, I'll be honest with you, we saw a ton of people for it who just frankly didn't fit the bill. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm not saying and, – and that's who we saw who was available. And also we had a situation where it was like – and they had to go to New Zealand. And a lot of people didn't want to go to New Zealand. Right, right. So, right. I mean, know, there are there's, there's there are a ex- lot of extenuating circumstances yeah, sometimes. There are extenuating circumstances that are that are always there. And we cast Manu, who's amazing, who I love, who's great in the show. But I remember when the show came out, I said, I know what brush we're going to get tarred with, and I yeah. totally, I totally get why. And I can't sit there and go. But I did. I said it wasn't for lack of trying, but you know, frankly. You gotta try guess, harder. You know, at the we didn't got we tried harder, and this year we we really made a concerted effort, and and I think you know we've got you know we've got some really you know amazing amazing new actors in the show, and I you know and you know selfishly I hope they bring us a new audience as well. You know what I mean? I want people to watch the shows, and I think if you can show people you know a version of 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 themselves or their experience on television, you can get you can get viewers. I mean, I think the the, the great thing about Badlands is. And I heard this a few times. I was like, this is the show I didn't know I needed. And I'm like, Great, that's what I want, you know? And, yeah. and you want people like, if you're not being serviced by, you know, other shows on television and you see, you know, yourself or your experience or the escapism you want on our show. Fantastic. Like, please come tell all your friends, tweet about <laughs> it. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my conversation with Al Goff, uh, one half of Goff Miller. Uh, if you want to hear the second half of this conversation, which Al and I go on and on about Smallville. If you want to listen to me nerd out about my favorite Superman show, tune in to DCTV Classics. This Sunday, we'll be dropping that episode. Uh, find DCTV Classics on Stitcher Radio and iTunes. Of course, always check out Hard Knock Life on iTunes and SoundCloud. Please, please rate and review us if you can. The more ratings and reviews we get, the easier it will be for others to find us. And, uh, yep, that's it. I'll see you next time. Kind. More like the people in the world seeking perspectives with a different line. The kids who share the interest together with a similar kind. When they said done lover for Spider-Man, they didn't mind. The activists, directors, comments, and the lectures. Fanboys, professional artists, and professors. Maybe a nerd who's just like you. Talking about the things that you like too. So I invite you to the NOC. In full color, you see.